There are certain nations and parts of the world, well, frankly, we do owe them. They have been exploited. However, there are people who, well, shameful and, and shameless, they will exploit the situation, taking the money of other people and uh, donating and devoting it to causing harm, violence, and terror. This is very interesting stuff. David Gutenstein Ross is in Washington, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Good to join you. Now, these are Islamic groups claiming aid, looking for foreign donations and foreign money and foreign help, but the money is actually going to jihadism. Is that the, the, the premise of this? Well, it, it, the answer is it depends on which groups we're talking about. Right. Um, obviously, you know, there are a wide variety of Islamic charities. There's more than 6,000 in the world. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of those charities uh, are not giving aid for jihadist causes. Right. Um, the concern is, though, uh, charities who do give aid to jihadist groups. Uh, to groups like Ansar al-Sharia Tunisia, uh, to jihadist groups in Syria, and the like. And uh, you know, evidence is emerging that, again, we're seeing this as a problem. About a decade ago, uh, it was widely acknowledged that there were certain charities uh, which served as financiers of al-Qaeda. And in the post-Arab uprising environment, uh, I think we're again seeing this phenomenon uh, begin to occur. Now, how clear-cut is this? Because traditionally, groups that have sometimes engaged in terror, the, the provisional IRA, for example, there is no doubt right. that they're a terrorist group. On the other hand, Sinn Féin, and it's quite difficult sometimes to distinguish one from the other, were organizing welfare help, medical help, legal aid in Belfast and Derry and so on. And so when they were given money, they would say, no, the violence has nothing to do with us. So that's just a scare tactic. Right. That, that depends upon the group. Uh, I mean, there, there's uh, a variety of groups, some of which don't have political wings and military wings. Uh, some of which it's a little bit less clear cut, and for some of which it's clear uh, what their orientation is, but you don't have a group policy of violence at this point in time. Right. You know, one thing that we've seen in the post Arab uprising environment is that in countries like Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Libya, suddenly there's a d degree of mobility uh, on the part of jihadist groups that they simply didn't have before. You know, a, a, an ability to undertake what they call dawa work, uh, which is exact, which is essentially proselytism uh, for their cause. And to some extent, it's, it, it's difficult to uh, separate them because, you know, work that's done, charitable work, providing social services or medical care, is also designed to win people over to the group's outlook. Mm. Where does the money come from? Well, uh, if you look at various organizations, in some cases they come from uh, the state or from wealthy donors. Uh, so in uh, the piece that you're referencing, the foreign policy uh, article that I uh, co-wrote with uh, Aaron Zellin, uh, we look at uh, a few charities. Uh, one of them, uh, Qatar Charity or Qatar Charitable Society. Um, another one, uh, the Revival of Islamic Heritage Society uh, in Kuwait. Uh, those are um, you know, organizations that can be regarded as uh, you know, government subsidized, although they also have uh, uh, sponsors who are uh, wealthy patrons uh, unaffiliated with the government. Hmm. Now, is it easy, is it possible for, for ordinary Muslims, perhaps, or non-Muslims who want to give money to help those who do need help and deserve help, can they distinguish? Are they able to? Could their money be donated to causes? And they assumed it was only for goodwill and for good purposes, but it's actually going into violence? Well, certainly that can happen. Uh, you know, there, there's very little uh, accountability for a lot of organizations, and that's not even uniquely a problem to uh, Muslims who want to give to charities. Exactly. Uh, one problem that, we, that, that you have with Western charities is uh, a lot of them are, are awfully inefficient, uh, where the money ends up going to fund overhead or a large amount of it goes to fund staff costs as opposed to going to uh, the cause that you think you're giving money for. Mm. Uh, likewise, in the case of um, you know, certain charities, uh, you might have uh, your funds uh, diverted to a cause that's very different than what you intended to give money for. So, uh, yes, the, the problem of donors not knowing precisely what their donations are going to um, is a problem. Mm -hmm. We've had this problem even with more mainstream charities that have a long, fairly long history and tradition in the West, and the money has been given to groups in the third world for aid, and I think sometimes with their knowledge it's gone into groups fighting wars of resistance, which tends to be a euphemism for, for terror groups. Uh, well, yes, um, you've had that as, as a problem in, in uh, a number of different areas, uh, absolutely. Uh, look, I mean, this is, the reason why I think that this is something worth concentrating on in the uh, post-Arab uprising environment is that if you go back, you know, about a decade or so ago, 
um, you know, a, a monograph that was produced for the 9-11 Commission talked about al-Qaeda sources of funding. Yep. It placed al-Qaeda's budget then at about $30 million a year uh, and said that you know, charities ended up forking out a lot of that money uh, for al-Qaeda. There it was a lot clearer that you know, if, you're fun if you're financing al-Qaeda, then uh, you know, you're financing a group that is primarily devoted to terrorism and violence. Sure. Now you're, you have a bit of a more complex environment where there are some groups that have had people who've undertaken violence, you know, uh, groups like Ansar al-Sharia Tunisia, uh, where you can see that their orientation is jihadist. The group isn't uh, you know, engaged in daily terrorism, however. It's a little bit more ambiguous. You know, someone could argue, a defender could argue, that, you know, yeah, this is a group that has a particular outlook. It has a jihadist outlook, but it's not engaged in violence right now. It's propagating its ideas. Mm -hmm. And so when money goes to that group, uh, it allows it to do things like uh, undertake social services. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, money come to it, uh, as I said, from uh, Gulf states. Uh, we've seen uh, it passing out literature from Saudi Arabia, uh, which suggests some Saudi sponsorship uh, for their dawah activities. And the question then becomes, uh, you know, is, is this money that's uh, will, will down the road uh, end up financing uh, violence. You have a much more open climate there uh, where groups who are jihadist in outlook uh, are allowed to uh, really compete openly uh, in the marketplace of ideas. That's a change for the region. Mm. Uh, and now where sponsors fit in, uh, that becomes one of those big questions that uh, in multiple ways is difficult to, uh, to deal with and formulate policy toward. Yeah, yeah, very interesting stuff. Appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure.